there's this old Chinese quote that essentially goes, or which essentially translates to, failure is the mother to success. Now, I didn't really understand this quote until sophomore year of high school. And for some context, uh, I didn't really have much issues in freshman year because, again, I'm trying to get into MIT and Rice, and those are very traditionally very hard to get into. And freshman year was fairly easy because COVID shut everything down and they were nice to us. So I was, <laughs> you know, it was easy to get those A's that I needed to get into schools like MIT and Rice. Sophomore year was more difficult because everybody had almost adjusted to COVID, and I was starting to take harder classes, such as AP World History and AP Calculus. Now, AP World History wasn't much of a concern for me because I really didn't have to worry about that because I'm not going into social sciences. I'm going into engineering, so AP Calculus, the core focus of engineering, is much more important than something like AP World History. And the pressure was on because, again, getting into MIT, getting into Rice, I need to get high grades, especially in those classes. So in the first semester, I actually ended the first semester with a B in calculus. Luckily for me, they understood that COVID had really messed a lot of stuff up, and so they were willing to be kind to us and said that if I could get a higher grade in the second semester, it would bump my grade up by one letter value. So essentially, I had to grade, get my grade back up from uh, an A in the second semester so I could get my B up to an A in the first semester. So there was double the amount of pressure in second semester because not only did I have to get an A for the sake of getting an A in calculus for second semester, but I also had to get an A to get an A in first semester as well, which added a lot of pressure uh, on myself. And so the first unit in second semester for calculus started off fairly, fairly well. Uh, I ended up with a 92 and everything was cruising. I was feeling confident in myself. If the rest of calculus could be like this, and second semester, then everything would be wonderful. Then came this lovely, 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 wonderful, brilliant, amazing unit called optimization. Now, if you don't know what optimization is, it is exactly as it sounds like. You have to optimize stuff. So essentially, you have to use calculus to find the highest possible value or the lowest possible value for something, which involves a lot of disgusting derivatives and plugging stuff in and generally just annoying math. And the thing is, is that each problem took me about 15 minutes to do, which I don't have a problem with. I can spend 15 minutes to an hour doing math as much as I want. It's not a problem for me. The problem is, is that they timed the tests, and they gave us 30 minutes to do a test, which, again, is fine. I can spend 30 minutes on a test, no problem. I've been doing it all my life. The issue is that they gave us four optimization problems to do in 30 minutes. Now, you don't need to be a calculus student to do the math on that one. <laughs> if I have four problems and it takes me 15 minutes to do, how long will it take me to do the test? One hour. If I have 30 minutes to do the test, how much am I going to finish? One half. Ladies and gentlemen, I got a 55 on that test. <laughs> and it's not even, it's, if you think that's bad, you don't even know how bad it is because our calculus tests are curved very kindly. There's a scale of nine points, you go from one to nine, and every point below nine, you essentially get docked 5% until you get down to one point, which is 55%. Do you know how hard it is to get a 55% on a calculus test? You can get one point on a calculus test by putting any number. I could put the number a billion on the paper and slap a unit on there, and I would get one point for that. I could put a dot on the paper and leave it like that and get one point on the calculus test. That's how badly I failed, because again, I didn't finish half of the test. So I went through a big turmoil because math had been my easiest subject at that point. I'd never really struggled with math. I never really, I could eat math for breakfast, essentially. I graduated freshman math with 99%. And getting down to a 55% on a test, which dropped my grade from that shiny little 92 to a really dis bad 75, was absolutely crushing to me, especially because, again, I'm trying to get into engineering, into MIT, and I can't do that with a 75% in calculus. So I went through a lot of them, which first of all, I was in denial because I was like, oh, I can't have done that badly because that's really, really bad. 55% is awful. And I thought, oh, maybe the teacher meant like 65% or 75%. Like those numbers are close on the keyboard and maybe she just mistyped it or something. But I had known that I didn't finish half the test. So I don't know what I was thinking. But when I came to terms with that, I had to have a lot of turmoil with anger and depression, because I was upset at myself at literally everyone else for not getting my grade, and I was 
it's sad because I lost my chances to get into MIT. And finally came the phase acceptance, except acceptance wasn't as much acceptance as it was apathy. You see, if you don't know what apathy means, apathy essentially means the state of not caring. And that's how I ended up, because I essentially thought, oh, you know what? It's an AP class, so my C, it'll curve up to a B, and a B is pretty good for a sophomore in calculus. And you know what? I can probably get a B at the end of the semester, and a B curves up to an A. And that's pretty good, too, especially for, again, a sophomore in calculus. And the scariest part is that I started compromising on my goals. Instead of shooting for MIT and Rice, traditionally hard schools to get into, I settled for something like CU Boulder. And I said, you know what? CU Boulder's easier to get into. <laughs> I could probably get into CU Boulder. And for me, that was when my mother figured out. Now, <laughs> my mom is in the audience today, so I have to be careful with what I say. Um, <laughs> but I love you, mom. Uh, she essentially slapped me awake and said, you are not done until you get your grade back up to that A. And so because of her, thankfully, I had to learn how to have a growth mindset. So essentially, a growth mindset and a fixed mindset were introduced to us in the beginning of the school year. A fixed mindset is essentially a place where you are not willing to learn, and the growth mindset is. And the problem I had with this is that they introduced them to us with these types of quotes back here, with quotes that I felt were superficial and pretentious. And I essentially said, this is dumb. Uh, I don't want have to have anything to do with this, partially because I never struggled with anything before, and partially because the way they introduced it was essentially, just have a growth mindset, and then you'll do good well in school. The problem is, is that they never told us how to have a growth mindset, so I had to figure out how to have a growth mindset through my experience in calculus. And I have to share that with you because this is really, really important if you want to deal with failure and to turn that failure from a, step, or from a mountain, insurpassable mountain, to a stepping stone. So I came up with four steps, essentially, to have a growth mindset and to deal with your failure. The first step, oddly enough, is acceptance. And now you see that's odd because that's the last step in the stages of grief, like I mentioned before. And except this time, this acceptance is actual acceptance, not apathy like I talked about before, but proper acceptance. Because chances are, if you mess up, you have some part in it. And it's not to say that it's completely your fault all the time, nor is it never your fault. You have to find the right amount of acceptance and you have to accept the proper amount of blame. And the proper amount is important because I know people who do not accept enough of the blame and blame everybody else, or who accept too much of the blame and start to have mental troubles that way because they put everything on themselves. So the first part is acknowledging your mistakes, acknowledging that, hey, I did something wrong. And the second part is analysis. Analysis because you have to figure out what you did wrong, and you have to see basically why I did it wrong, what I did wrong, and how can I make it better. So in my case for calculus, I had to say, you know what? Uh, I didn't study. I didn't really pay attention in class. I didn't do the homework. Three things that would have probably gotten me a higher grade on the test, but I didn't do it. And that's why I messed up. That's why I failed on that test. And how could I make it better? Well, this was a fairly simple case of, hey, do my homework, study, pay attention in class. That's it. And so the next step is emotional mastery. Now, emotional mastery is a bit tough because as you're analyzing everything you did wrong, you're not going to feel very good about yourself. You're going to be upset, you're going to be angry, and you're going to be, well, in emotional turmoil. And you're going to have to learn how to master your emotions. Now, I <laughs> ranted before about how people just told you to do something and then left you to drown in the deep end. And Saying master your emotions is like saying be happy and walking off the stage. And that's not proper, that's not what I want to do, so I'm going to give you a quick guide on how you could potentially master your emotions. And this is with the sources of strength. Now this wheel right here represents eight slices of your life that can potentially help you through trying times. Uh, for me, the slices, of li or the slices of pie that help me the most are spirituality and healthy activities. For one, spirituality, being a Christian, I help out in my church a lot, it has helped me a lot. The amount of times I said God helped me during that time in calculus was probably more times than God wanted to hear. Um, <laughs> and my second one is healthy activities, because I love playing tennis, as Jack said before in my introduction. And for you non-tennis players, you have no idea how therapeutic that sport is. You are given a rubber ball and a trampoline, and you get to hit it as hard as you can at someone across from the net. 
and there's a rule because you're supposed to hit it as hard as you can at the person across the net. And yeah, usually that person's my dad, so I'm sorry, but not really sorry. But it's really, really, really nice to just be able to hit a ball really, really hard at someone else, whether you like him or not. And it doesn't have to be those two. It doesn't have to be spirituality or healthy activities. It could be something else. It could be positive friends. My friends are here. They're crazy and insane. I don't know why I'm friends with them, but I am. And they're wonderful. They help me through things. Uh, it could be generosity. You can volunteer, give of your time, give of yourself, and that can help a lot. Healthy activities doesn't have to be a sport. It could be going for walks or baking or reading a book. And you identify some of those things in order to make yourself feel better, deal with that emotional anxiety and stress. And the final step is perseverance. Now, perseverance is a strange step because it essentially means start over again. Because perseverance means keep going. Keep going and going and going. Because guess what? Your failure isn't going to resolve itself as soon as you identify the failure. I can't go up to you and say, oh, I messed up because I didn't study. Can you give me an A now? That's not going to work because I earned the 55 and now I have to make up for it. So essentially, you have to keep going. I had to keep trying and trying at that calculus until I got it back up to that A as you know, my mother wanted me to. And in terms of that, it took me about three months to get my grade back up to an A the rest of the semester. And that's on the short end of the scale for recovering from failures. Because sometimes failures can take a long, long time. Imagine if, let's say, you ruin a relationship. You break the trust of a parent or a friend. How long is that going to take to fix? It's going to take months, even years, for your relationship to not even fully heal, but be at a place where you're satisfied with. So perseverance means go over. And guess what? While you're trying to fix the failure, you're probably going to mess up again. And you're going to have to repeat all four steps in order to properly deal with your failures. So uh, they want us to give us a call to action or give you guys a call to action after we're done with everything. And uh, I can't really do that because I can't really tell you to jump off the couch and go ruin your next relationship or to fail your next test because uh, that's a really bad idea. So, but guess what? We're humans. We kind of suck at not failing. So, and I speak from experience. <laughs> um, but so whenever you do fail, try these out because these four steps have really, really helped me in order to do pop quiz. Ooh, let's see if you were paying attention. Go ahead and shout out the four steps of failure for me. All right, what was step one? Acceptance. Acceptance. Good. What was step two? Analysis. Good. What was step three? Emotional mastery. Ooh, that's a tough one. What's step four? Perseverance, all right. And I really, really hope these take you to heart because I had to learn these the hard way and you're given an opportunity here to learn these the easy way from me, which I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not. But hopefully, learning these four steps will not have to make you have a tiny Asian lady <laughs> smack you awake in order to get you to make up for your mistakes. Thank you all.